All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Larry Lynn, as many of you know, and this is a course about refugee resettlement efforts. I have the privilege of introducing our speakers from Bethany Christian Services in Grand Rapids. Christine Van Nord is the program director for Bethany's Refugee Adult and Family Programs. She received a BA in Christian Education at Northwestern College and an ME in Language and Literacy at University of South Australia. Christine has over 20 years of experience working with refugees, including 11 years with Bethany. She has also lived in the Middle East for five years and speaks Arabic. Deb Hookwater has worked at Bethany Christian Services for 13 years as the Church and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Refugee Resettlement Program. She earned a BS in Legal Administration from Grand Valley State University, and Deb works to encourage and train churches and community groups to welcome and assist living refugee, uh, pardon me, arriving refugee families. Some of you with us today, in fact, I think there's quite a few of you, have had the pleasure of working with Deb locally over the last five or more years. Please join me in giving a hasp welcome to Christine and Deb. Take it over. So Christine and Deb, just make sure you're unmuted. Um, and would you like me to go ahead and let you say um, some introduction to the material or would you like me to just go ahead and start the video? Um, I think that we would like you just to start the video or okay. I thank all of you for being here. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day. We hope you find it informative and helpful and interesting. Uh, we're going to show a short video that was filmed in Grand Rapids, a lot of it at our office, and then we have a PowerPoint um, with some slides, and then I'm thrilled to say that Larry is going to share a little bit about his experience, um, and then we hope that there will be, I, uh, if there are questions, we hope that there will be answers. <laughs> so here comes the video. Okay, just a reminder to listen for sound because that's always a little tricky when we're getting these started. So here we go. Do we all hear sound? So Bethany started working with refugees in the late 1960s with um, Cubans the fall of Saigon. The resettlement program in the U.S. is essentially a 90-day program. That initial 90 days of resettlement involves preparing a home for the refugee, welcoming them at the airport, getting them connected with local benefits and local services, getting kids in school, adults in English class, and working towards um, employment as well. We have a lot of other programs that can also support and help the refugee up to five years in the United States because that initial resettlement time is overwhelming. There's a lot of things that take place during that time. So that's where that continuum of care and being able to help with those services beyond that 90 days is so important. Uh, my name is Miguel, last name Socorro, and uh, uh, been with Profile for 12 years, and I'm uh, one of the production managers. I mean, Bethany was was that link that walked me through success. Profile's been partnering with Bethany Christian Services for approximately uh, 11 years, and over the years, we've hired many, many uh, refugees through Bethany. Miguel's been extraordinarily successful here, and he's developed into one of our key people on the operations side of the business. Here's a person who, uh, 11 years ago, was just arriving from Cuba, spoke no English, uh, completely disoriented, and through our connections with Bethany, fortunately, within a month of arriving in the U.S., landed at Profile, started in our lowest entry position, worked his way up, when the opportunity arose, uh, he was promoted to extrusion manager, and now he runs our 24-7 operations within our extrusion area. Coming here and finding that you got that hand that 
extends to you and, and give you not only the material stuff, but, but the freedom. That you know you're free again. You, you know, that, that's amazing. And, and Bethany did that for us. Our vision is to give refugees and immigrants an opportunity, empowering opportunities to be able to thrive here. We do the work that we do um, each and every day, knowing that our clients are our value, knowing that we, we appreciate who they are um, as human beings, and we look forward to seeing them thrive. Many of our refugee services are focused on those first five years in the United States. And during that time, we are really building skills and empowering refugees to know how to navigate the system here in the United States, as well as getting them connected with churches and local volunteers that can help them and be friends with them throughout the process. Hi, Hi Mary. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. We were worried about in the during uh, our journey to U.S., like who will take us from the airport, with whom we will meet there. So, but when we uh, come out from the airport and uh, see the crowd of the welcome, uh, the welcome crowd of the First Presbyterian Church and the Bethany Christian Services, and at the same moment I felt that uh, we are not alone in this corner of the earth. We knew that these. Uh, four adults were going to come off the plane probably scared, uh, probably tired. And I remember the first time to, uh, Muhammad said anything to me. He said, uh, I'm finally relaxed. I think that the church is the best way to work through this process of welcoming and having a family live amongst us, even though their culture and their religion may be different. The church are, are the eyes and the ears and the mind of the refugee. Without, uh, without church, the refugee is unable to do anything. Well, I think the reason it's successful was because it wouldn't even happen without someone like Bethany. Uh, an organization like Bethany has the expertise to get the process moving and to take care of things that an individual church would not have the expertise to do. We cannot do the work that we do alone. Fortunately, we have churches and community members who have the heart to come alongside of us and provide some of the, the support that these families need. There are many needs that we have within our programs. I think uh, local partners is a great need. Having churches and community groups come alongside refugees so that they are not alone, that they have friends here that can connect with them and help with more needs than what Bethany is able to do from a case management standpoint. We also have a great need for in-kind donations of items, funding, that's always an area of need. We also are in need of um, prayer support and having people um, pray for refugees and what they're going through. We are in the largest refugee crisis ever in history. And so the needs for refugees are great and therefore our needs at Bethany are also great. Okay, I think that we're all set. Um, Deb, you're gonna share a PowerPoint. Do you wanna talk through that real quickly? And you're currently muted, Deb, just so you know. Great, we can see your presentation and it's just in, um, it's not in presentation mode quite yet. Perfect. Yeah. I think Christine, do you want to start with the, with the PowerPoint? Yes. 
thank you all so much for being here today. We appreciate the opportunity to get to talk about refugees and about Bethany and about what we're doing. Um, so um, as uh, was mentioned in the video, we are in the uh, largest, the worst uh, refugee crisis that we've ever seen. Um, there are more um, forced migrants um, than ever before. So Deb, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so there are, um, this, this number actually, uh, we can't quite keep up with it. We hear it can be as much as uh, 79.5 million people are displaced in the world. These are people that have had to leave their um, primary um, home and go either to a, another place within their um, country or um, to another country. Um, some of them are, are fleeing um, uh, persecution and are therefore are refugees. And some of them are um, leaving because of environmental issues or economic issues or different things that make it impossible for them to stay um, in their, um, uh, in where they would call home. Deb, you wanna go to the next one? So migrants are people who are choosing to leave. Now the choice may not be a great one. It may be because um, something has happened um, in, their, um, in their home that makes it um, unviable for them to continue to live there, but they have made that choice to move to another place um, within their country or outside of their country. Refugees are forced to flee. They are in a situation where they are fleeing for their lives, where there is no other option but to flee to another country. Next. This is the um, United Nations definition of a refugee. So this is somebody who has a well-founded fear of persecution. And that could be for any number of reasons because of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So um, every refugee I have ever met, and I have met quite a few of them, has not wanted to leave their country. They have wanted to stay where they are at, but they're in a situation where they don't have a choice, where they're fleeing for their lives, and um, they're going to uh, uh, another place of safety. Um, and so, um, they have um, endured many, many difficult things that um, are hard for me to even imagine um, what they have gone through. Next. So 50% um, of refugees are children and 68% of refugees are those that are survivors of violence or torture. They're women and girls at risk or others with um, protection needs. So when we talk about refugees, we are talking about truly the most vulnerable. Um, people who are, um, again, fleeing for their lives and are in very vulnerable situations. Next. Um, there are um, multiple global issues that are impacting um, refugees having to flee. So we have the war um, in Syria that has created um, at least 6.7 million refugees, potentially many more than that. Um, we have the generalized violence um, that has uh, caused people to have to flee. Um, we look at in places like the Congo where there has been ethnic violence um, on behalf of militias um, that have caused many people to have to flee for their lives. Um, and then it could be persecution based on that race or political belief or religious belief. These are the reasons that people are fleeing um, and we see that increased number. I believe it's about 26 million out of that 79.5 million um, uh, that are forcibly displaced, 26 million of them are refugees. Next. Here are some of the refugee producing um, countries. So again, we see um, Syria. Um, this one has it at 6.6, .6. again, 6.7. We've heard numbers greater than that. It's, it's hard to, to document that exactly. Um, 
uh, and you see some of the other um, people groups there, we will see many of the same people groups coming in um, to the United States um, as refugees as well um, from these same groups. So these are the countries that are producing refugees right now. People are fleeing these countries into a second country. Next. And oh, this looks like the couple slides are on top of each other. So um, uh, just to, um, just to share um, the, Deb, can you go back to the previous slide of the refugee producing countries? So the countries that are hosting them are typically the country that is right next door. Um, so in Syria, you have um, the um, majority of refugees have fled to Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and Egypt. So the countries that are bordering um, Syria. Um, in Afghanistan, they have fled to Pakistan or to Iran. Um, and so it's typically the country right next door. That country right next door is typically not set up to be able to handle the number of refugees that they have. And some of the countries have an extreme amount of refugees. Um, and so it's very difficult for them. They do not have a, a specific um, process set up. Um, they're working with the UN. Um, sometimes um, the refugees are put into refugee camps. Um, only about 10% of the Syrians are in refugee camps. Um, the rest of them are urban refugees trying to find a place um, that they can live. Um, and so it becomes very difficult on that hosting country um, to be able to um, respond to the needs of refugees. And the um, uh, services and assistance for them is just not enough. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So these are, sorry, the slide got a little wonky on us. So um, I'll just explain what's going on. So this is um, uh, the arrivals that came into the US um, in uh, 2020. Um, and by um, state, Michigan is the one that's in that blue color. Um, we typically are in the top five or so of resettlement. Um, into the United States. Um, and that is true um, for this past year as well. And that's for the whole state. Next slide. There has been a decline in resettlement into the United States um, for a number of reasons. Um, back in 2016, that's when we um, accepted, I believe it was um, almost 85,000 um, refugees. And then we had the change in presidential um, administration and that um, significantly um, impacted the uh, refugee program. There was a lot smaller number of refugees that were able to come into the United States. The president signs a presidential determination um, every year um, stating how up to how many refugees can come into the United States. And so that has been decreased um, in the last um, uh, uh, four years or so. And there's been a decline um, globally as well. There are 35 countries that do refugee resettlement. So this is when um, it is determined that a refugee cannot stay viably in their second country and can't return to their first country um, because it's unsafe for them they're considered for refugee resettlement. There are a lot of refugees that need resettlement. Less than a half a percent of refugees are actually resettled into a third country like the United States. Um, and when the United States started receiving less refugees um, into the US, other countries also did the same thing and had less refugees come into the US as well. With this new administration, there is an increased um, commitment to um, uh, welcoming more refugees and to making sure that we have the system set up to be able to welcome those refugees. The processing overseas has been um, quite decimated and um, it's gonna take a while to build those numbers back up. So even though um, 
Uh, the president has signed a presidential determination for this year for 62,500 refugees to come in with COVID and then with building the program back up. We're expecting that number to be closer to 20,000 refugees coming in. We're still unsure. We're, we're told that it's gonna be a busy um, fall, a uh, busy August and September, um, welcoming refugees in before the end of the fiscal year, which ends at the end of September. Um, but we're just not sure at this point how many more refugees are gonna come in um, to the United States. Um, the need is great for refugee resettlement. And so we do look forward to building the program back up um, it is gonna take time and effort to build that program back up. Um, the program in the United States is run by the Department of State. And so it will take time um, for them to go overseas and to um, do the processing. And then with COVID, everything has been slowed down as well. Um, so it will take time to build that back up. Next slide. Um, these are, again, it's showing a little wonky on this side, but um, hopefully it gives you at least a visual picture. Out of the 493 that came um, into um, uh, Michigan last year, these are the people groups that they came from. Um, the largest group is um, the Congolese, and for us in Grand Rapids and in West Michigan, so also placing into Holland, um, the um, the largest people group that we have are the Congolese. Um, the Congolese um, have um, uh, some pastors that were overseas in the camps and those pastors have now moved to Grand Rapids. And so Grand Rapids is one of the um, top places overseas that the refugees are asking to come to. The next largest group that we have are the Burmese. Um, and then we also receive some Afghans um, Sudanese, Eritreans. Um, we, for a while there, were not receiving any Syrians, and we just had a Syrian family arrive um, a couple weeks ago, and they have actually been placed in Grand Haven. Um, we're hoping to build up a little Syrian community there in Grand Haven. Um, in Holland, um, we have a Congolese um, community um, that is growing um, there. Um, I believe we've placed four families in um, the Holland area that are from the Congo, and we are going to be increasing that. Um, a, another family will be coming in the next little bit um, here um, to Holland. Um, and we have placed Cubans um, in the past in Holland and Burmese, um, as well as probably a couple other people groups that I'm forgetting about um, that we've placed there as well. So next slide. Deb, can you go to the next slide? There you go. Um, so again, sorry, I don't know why these slides aren't showing clearly, but it gives you an idea. So the Congolese are the um, largest people group that we are welcoming. Um, Congo is a very diverse um, country. Um, and um, there are over 250 ethnic groups there. There has been a, a history, a long period of time of um, ethnic violence and militia groups that the um, country does not, the government does not stop and um, in many ways kind of allows these militia groups to go in to different um, villages. And um, we hear the same story over and over again about how a militia group came into a village with machetes and guns, um, uh, going through and killing people, raping women, making the family watch the rape, then killing the husband. Um, they have gone through horrible, horrible violence. And, um, Many of them uh, fled um, years ago into refugee camps. The average length of time that a Congolese family is in a refugee camp is about 20 years. So they're living in those refugee camps. Kids are being born in those refugee camps. Um, and so it's a, it's a long time that they're in those camps. Next slide, please. 
The U.S. has a really long history of welcoming refugees. Um, this is something that we have done from the very beginning um, where immigrants have been coming into the United States, refugees have been coming. Um, and it used to be where churches would um, welcome refugees. And um, this is uh, what I hear was the, the process in the 60s and the 70s. Um, in 1980, they established the Refugee Act, um, which established refugee resettlement program. It has changed um, in the last 40 some years, but it looks similar to what it did then. Um, and um, there are nine national resettlement agencies that partner with the Department of State and they, um, uh, they run refugee resettlement. There's a lot of um, government um, process in that in terms of um, things that we do. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and we now, the resettlement agency takes the lead, but we partner with churches and other community groups um, to be able to welcome the refugee well. Um, but there is a long history of, of welcoming refugees in the United States. Next slide. Now, Deb is going to talk about what things are like in the refugee camps. Yes, um, thanks, Christine. I um, had the privilege of going to visit a refugee camp in 2013 as a um, part of a contingency from Church World Service, which is our national air agency. Um, this is not that camp. I will be showing pictures from that camp, but it was um, life changing for me to see where they have come from. I look at refugees differently when I'm at the airport and they walk off the plane and I wonder, how did you do that? The process is long, the process is difficult. Um, and I also see them uh, six months, a year after they arrive. And um, after seeing where many of them started, it just amazes me at how, how much they can accomplish in such a short time. Um, I, you know, there's the words. So there are very limited or no education opportunities in the camp. The camp I was in in Rwanda did have some NGOs and UNHCR-led schools. Um, so it depends on, on the camp um, very much. Uh, we get bios from families when they come and they will report different language levels and education levels. And it is such a wide variety depending on the resources in, in the camp where they came from. So. Um, we all, I always tell the churches and the groups I work with, we don't know until they come, you know, much about them. Um, very little medical care. The camp I was in at the time had 14,000 residents and only one um, care provider, one doctor that worked around the clock seven days a week, um, delivered all the babies and, you know, everything, um, one doctor. Their, um, their pharmacy was the size of my uh, coat closet here, very small, very few things in it. So not a lot of opportunity for medical care. So that is one reason why when they come, that is always kind of um, what we tackle almost right away, things that have gone too long without care. It's, it's uh, wonderful that we can start to address some of those issues. Um, of course, there's a ration card for food and necessities, long lines um, for meals I saw. Um, no limited or no employment opportunities. Some are employed in the camp. Some camps are uh, more porous and they can actually leave the camp and, and attempt to work. If they would get caught, they could be in trouble. So um, often it's the most daring that have, um, that have had been employed while living in the camp. Of course, a lack of safety, um, no mental health care, and warehousing, very crowded camps, um, very restricted. This is actually me in the camp that I visited in Rwanda back in 2013. The buildings that you see are actually what um, housed the school and the, the doctor's office. Um, their homes actually looked a lot more like um, huts um, I was told by UNHCR that you can tell who's new and, um, at the camp 
because they're given a tarp that says UNHCR and a few sticks and said, make yourself a home. If you can still read the UNHCR in blue letters on their home, that means they're, they're relatively um, newcomers, um, but most of them are covered with mud over years. And you know, they've been there, like Christine has said, sometimes two decades, especially in this camp, um, many, many years. It's interesting to me because now, um, uh, uh, most of our clients, Congolese clients, are coming from the same camp. So it's very, very exciting for me. And, and to be able to tell them at the airport, I, I've been in Gahembe camp. Um, I met your doctor, you know, I've probably seen your house. They, um, we have a special bond, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I like to show this to people when I make presentations at churches or schools. This is in one of those huts, in one of those homes, and this was their kitchen. So they make their own stove um, from rocks. I would happen to be there on wood distribution day, a big truck comes in and there's a long winding um, line waiting to get their wood for the month. Um, so I show this just to kind of show people who have um, taken up the challenge of welcoming a family that there is so much to learn. Um, they go from here to you know using a, a stove in their kitchen and even a microwave and, um, Again, it's just amazing how quickly they learn and how successful they come. Um, I am in awe of our clients very often. Um, I think Christine, I think you're on for this again. All right. So with all of these refugees, what are the options? Um, one option is voluntary repatriation, so going back to their home country. And unfortunately, that's just not an option for a lot of people. Um, the second one is to integrate locally where they're at. Um, and depending on where they fled to, this is more of a viable option than others. Um, so for example, in Uganda, they're actually giving land um, to refugees to start their own little farm and their own home so that they can um, become a part of the Ugandan community and they're giving them pathway towards Ugandan citizenship. Um, kids are able to go to school and so they're, they're able to get on a pathway. Um, now that's not true for everybody in Uganda, but that is a, a, a model that they are trying to do there in Uganda. Um, there are other places where um, people have been able to um, make a home and, and start a life. I've heard a lot of Iraqis that had means and they were able to start businesses in Jordan um, and get started there. There's others that are there in Jordan that are not able to get um, any kind of work permit. Um, they're really not able to stay there viably. So um, we always wanna try the voluntary repatriation if that's possible. Um, Want to try that local integration if at all possible. If it's not an option, then the option is for resettlement. And that's that third country resettlement that I said that 35 different countries are doing, including the U.S. The U.S. has always been the leader in this. Um, Canada in the last couple of years has started um, resettling more refugees than um, the U.S. Um, hopefully that will, um, we will increase our numbers here in the U.S. Um, again and be a leader um, in resettlement. Next. So um, that third country resettlement is, is those with the greatest need and the most immediate need for protection. We do see um, people with major medical needs that cannot be served overseas. Um, that do come um, for resettlement here. We get a, a wide variety of people that come for resettlement. Next. So this um, slide just shows you that, that great history that the US has in welcoming refugees. Um, at the fall of Saigon in 1980, um, President Reagan welcomed over 200,000 refugees um, during that time. 
it then has ebbed and flowed since then based on the, the need and the number of refugees coming. Um, there were two big dips um, that took place, one around September 11. No refugees were involved in anything related to September 11, but they wanted to take the opportunity to make sure that the security, the vetting process was as strong as it could possibly be. So there was a decrease in refugees coming right around that time of September 11, and then an increase since then. And then we had the decrease um, in the last uh, four years with the um, Trump administration. Um, and, um, and then right now with COVID that has also decreased numbers as well. Next. So refugees flee their first country. So in this example, they flee the Congo. Um, they flee into a second country like Rwanda. Um, they register with the United Nation Higher Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, as refugees. As I said before, they might be in a refugee camp or they might be in an urban setting, but they will register there with the UN as refugees. And then the wait starts. They may um, stay in that second country or return to the first country. If it's determined that they, um, there's really no other option and that refugee resettlement is the best choice, then they get referred um, to a third country like the United States. Um, the US, as I mentioned before, that process is run by the Department of State. Um, it is a, a lengthy process. Um, it involves um, multiple um, interviews and security checks. Um, USCIS, CIA, FBI, and multiple other agencies. Um, I believe it's six agencies in total are involved in the process um, of the vetting process. And when in doubt, if they cannot verify the information, if they're unsure, they say no. Um, and so um, it's this extremely in-depth vetting process. No visitor to the United States is vetted more in-depth than refugees are. Um, and it takes a minimum of 200 days and an average of about two years to go through that vetting process. And, um, and then they also go through medicals, um, overseas medicals. Um, they do a, a cultural orientation overseas. Um, and then they come to the United States and are welcomed here um, to the US um, by um, one of the nine national resettlement agencies. Each one of those agencies has affiliate offices, local offices that um, welcome them. Bethany is one of those um, offices. We are um, an affiliate of Church World Service, one of the nine national um, resettlement agencies. The other one locally is Samaritas, um, and they are an affiliate of Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services. Um, and um, so then we um, start the process of welcome. And um, you can go to the next slide. So um, each, res each refugee is matched with a resettlement agency. Um, and um, if, the, if the refugee has what's called a US tie, a family or a friend um, in the United States, they can request to go to where that family or friend is. Um, if they do not, um, the National Resettlement Agency determines which one of their um, affiliate offices could best serve that refugee based on the languages available, the type of services available to be able to help with medical needs and different things like that. The resettlement agency does um, everything, but we partner um, with local churches and, and community groups as part of that welcome. And we'll, you'll hear more about what that looks like. Um, so we arrange to make sure that everything is addressed. Some of these things might be done by um, a church or community group. Some of them might be done by the resettlement agency themselves. But we um, make sure that they have housing set up. Um, we um, meet them at the airport. Um, we help them apply for social security and for public benefits. 
We help kids get um, uh, registered in school, adults registered in English classes. We do lots and lots of cultural orientation and education. Um, everything that you can imagine um, that is necessary um, for the refugee coming. We, um, the refugee resettlement time period is 90 days, which is not enough. And so thankfully we do have some other programs at Bethany that can help um, refugees beyond that initial 90 days. Next slide. Deb, I think you're up next. Yes, I always like to see arrival. This is, of course, some of the one of the most fun parts of my job is to be at the airport with a community group. This is actually a group from a local college that welcomed this family, and they did an amazing job. Um, we also we even had a softball team from a local college be a co-sponsor, and and uh, we were able to take the family to the softball games, and that was a really fun experience. So groups are normally churches, but not always. Um, like I said, a lot of colleges, we've even had high schools and middle schools serve as co-sponsors, obviously with parents and staff involved as well. But of course the airport is, is really fun. I always like to tell people um, when you see that bag in the middle, the IOM bag, um, every refugee comes with a bag like that. And so I've mentioned that to different groups and they have reported later. I always say, if you see that bag, whether you're traveling in, at O'Hare or wherever, know that that's a refugee that just set foot into this country, run and, and welcome them. And I've heard from several that have done that. So now you know, if you see that bag, that's a refugee. They're new here, um, welcome them. <laughs> Co-sponsorship, um, that is the, the part that the church or the community group plays. Um, there's a little bit of confusion. That name is a little confusing because I'll have a church um, agree to be co-sponsor and then they'll say, well, who's our other you know, sponsor. Co implies two churches, but really the sponsor is Bethany um, and the church is called the co-sponsor. So it's a public-private partnership where Bethany is funded to provide all of the services required by our government, and there are many. Um, and then the, the church or community group um, has what I think is the fun part. They get to be their friends. They get to walk beside them as they adjust to their new life here and, and watch them achieve, you know, many goals. So we asked for six months from the community group. I know Christine had mentioned it's a 90 day um, resettlement program. We have something called, some of you know the match grant that extends that to six months. And so that's why we kind of choose, a, makes sense to have a six month commitment from the church or community group. And everything we do as partners, actually we call it a three-way partnership, Bethany, church, and family is um, working toward that goal of self-sufficiency in six months. So we really, really um, push that date as being an important date. We recommend our clients learn what they can, ask questions, um, because we, we make clear that you don't have your co-sponsor group for the rest of your time. Um, it's a limited time. And then we, we say, um, let's have a celebration at six months because the relationship transitions from one of co-sponsorship to one of merely friendship. Um, so there are no obligations after six months on behalf of the church or co-sponsor, um, but friendships most often develop. And we, our clients are aware that it's more of a two-way friendship at that point and they'll help, they'll help too. Um, so like I mentioned, it's a public-private partnership. And then once a, a community group or church commits to taking a specific family, we get an average of a two-week notice. So we don't get a lot of um, time to prepare. We're always preparing. But then once we get this, um, the arrival notice, a flight scheduled, you know, we do have to kind of scramble. We have to find housing, which is right now, of course, you can imagine the most difficult piece of the puzzle and it is like a puzzle putting things together um, and then the church you know once we know the location it's easier obviously to find the church that um, is a good fit for them and then we go back and we provide orientation to the volunteers so um, I just had one a couple nights ago and there were maybe 15 people in the room eager to learn about the family that they were about to receive um, so you know friendship like I said is the most important piece 
um, of this puzzle that we try to put together. And that's where the Church of Community Group comes in. But also just to show them around town, you know, especially, for instance, in Holland, the family that's coming to Holland, um, they need to know, you know, where's the nearest grocery store, where's the nearest park where their children can play, um, you know, how to use the library, different things like that, that the the case manager is really not on, on her list of duties. She's getting them, you know, other assistance as necessary, but um, showing them their community is one of the most important things that a co-sponsor can do. Um, and again, I said the self-sufficiency piece, that, that's our goal. Often we have a, a celebration at six months, especially if a church was involved, you know, we'll go and um, I remember being at, at Larry's church when, when they ended their six month um, resettlement project. And, and it, it is a fun day where you celebrate the accomplishments of the family. And again, signify kind of the end of the resettlement period. These are things that the co-sponsor usually does. There's often a big crowd at, at the airport. And again, that's one of the best parts. A lot of welcome signs and balloons and all that kind of thing. Young and old, kids make signs. It's been, it's really a fun celebration. Um, housing setup is what a church or co-sponsor group all, um, almost always does. We have a housing coordinator at Bethany as well to kind of guide it and supplement things that aren't donated. Um, there's a welcome pack of required items for their home that churches usually will collect that can be gently used. Um, Whatever is not collected, our housing coordinator fills in the blanks. So there's no pressure to do it all. I like to tell groups that we have a plan B and a plan C, but if you're co-sponsor, you're plan A. Um, but there's no pressure to provide everything because we have um, plenty of safety nets. Um, transportation. We teach our clients to ride the public transportation very soon after arrival. Uh, but there are a few early appointments where we're really hoping that the uh, community co-sponsor will provide transportation, especially some important medical um, appointments where they really can't be late, that kind of thing. Um, medical assistance, we have uh, staff as well that, that guides that, but sometimes co-sponsor groups and churches have former nurses on their team and um, we really would, would take whatever assistance can be offered in that area. Tutoring is huge. If you have, if a group has people who are willing to meet one-on-one -on -one with our clients to practice their new English skills, um, that is extremely helpful. So uh, we always say you don't have to be a teacher or even speak English well. Um, we had once an 11 year old who was a very effective tutor. So I think I always say if she can do it, you can do it. So um, we really encourage that. And then much more, just you know, being the eyes um, for the family and seeing what their needs might be and whether they can, you can solve those needs or bring them to us. Um, we really appreciate either way. This kind of puts it in two categories so that you can just see it a little maybe more clearly. On the left is Bethany as sponsor of the families and on the right is the church or group as the co-sponsor. So I know that Christine kind of went through all of these, especially on the left side. And I think I probably just did on the right. Um, but again, it's kind of a loose uh, list. You know, we, whatever the church has to offer, we will take and whatever they, they can't do, we will, we will fill in the blanks. You'll see that some of those like budget mentoring, I often say, sometimes there are people at a church that that's their gift. We wanna use what gifts are there Sometimes churches say, oh, I'm not touching that. And we'll say, that's okay. Our case manager um, will do it. So, and this is a cartoon. I just, I don't know. I think it speaks volumes because I've seen it in person. <laughs> um, the cultural differences, you know, especially when working with a local church or school, um, you know, we just, at that orientation, especially, we talk about the differences and what to expect with the particular people group that you're receiving. So there is quite a bit of training um, for that, for the volunteers, you know, um, that are really maybe stepping out of their comfort zone. We try to make it more comfortable. Um, but being aware, you know, one thing too, I often say, um, Americans hate silence. That is something that we're so uncomfortable with. And so orientation, we talk about that a little bit. You know, the silence is okay. A smile speaks a million world, words. And, you know, how to draw pictures or pantomime, you know, so we talk about that quite a bit at the orientation. 
this is a church um, in Grand Rapids here that um, co-sponsored, actually they've co-sponsored quite a few families over the last five or six years. They kind of have it down to a science and so they'll call us and say, send us another family. That one was easy. <laughs> um, I don't hear that a lot because of course, you know, each family has unique challenges. But what, I, what this church did, I thought was interesting is they have a little church van and instead of having um, English tutors go to the home and on their own schedule, this church would pick up the family, the refugee family in their van, take them to church on Wednesday nights, divide them up into rooms with volunteers and they each had their own little private tutoring um, lesson on Wednesday evening. So there are many ways to do it and we want to do it the way that works for the church. There's no one, one way to do almost anything. Essential skills of a co-sponsor group um, is hospitality, of course, is probably number one, a welcoming heart. Flexibility is huge. Um, we all, I always say to orientation, whatever you think is gonna happen, uh, expect the opposite. Sense of humor, it's kind of um, very important, but easy to come up with stories that kind of make you chuckle once you look back, I, probably more so. Um, and fun to learn about other cultures and customs. Um, all of us have, have learned a lot and fun to get your family involved. You know, even my children have learned so much about other cultures that it's um, been a good thing for our whole family and most families would say the same, I'm sure. Patience is huge. Um, and then just, just, just to show the love of Christ, of course, to a family who just really needs to, to feel it. And then reminders that we give, you know, friendship is the, is the biggest um, thing that the family needs. We do have ongoing support. We have a group called the Four Group Friends of Refugees that meet occasionally that we, um, volunteers who have done this in the past or currently working with the family get together and just kind of share best practices and ask questions and solve each other's problems. And, and there's a lot of laughter too, because we share stories and, and have fun um, talking about the successes of the families. The definition of success is something huge that we talk about. Um, churches think that they the family has to be perfect before they can let go. Um, and you know, we talk about that, that's not gonna happen for any of us. Um, none of us are gonna be perfect. And so realizing that co-sponsorship is simply giving a leg up to a refugee family, giving them the basics that they need to continue to learn and to continue to grow, acknowledging that they will make mistakes like we all do, um, and they'll learn from them like we do as well. And just to give them um, the credit they deserve, I guess, to, um, to know that, that they'll be fine without, without you over helping, I guess, is what we talk quite a bit about at orientation. And then to celebrate accomplishments. You know, they accomplish so much in such a short time and just to make sure that you're acknowledging them. Um, because sometimes they just need to hear it. Here's another arrival picture. This is a church that was at the airport. Um, and then I'll pass this off to Christine. So in addition to our refugee resettlement program, um, there's other ways that you can be involved and can help. And one of them is through our refugee foster care program. Um, if you have a, an extra room at your house, maybe you're an empty nester now and you'd like to um, fill that space back up, um, uh, hosting a refugee youth um, is an incredibly um, life-changing and valuable thing. Um, we have um, information nights that we do about refugee foster care where you can learn um, about what it would mean to um, foster for youth. There's also respite care where you can do it um, with a little bit less commitment. Um, there's supervised independent living that is an option um, uh, where essentially they're, they're living in the room of, in your home and, and you do a little bit of supervision, but not as much as like foster care. Um, so there are, there are really good options for that. Um, uh, there are needs, um, the refugee foster care is um, receiving some refugees from overseas, those that have um, been separated from their parents, don't know where their parents are at, or have been orphaned, um, and they're um, providing a home for them here um, in the U.S. Um, 
uh, and then some of these um, kids have come across through the border. Um, we try to reunite those kids as much as possible, but there are some circumstances where it's not possible. There is no reunification options. And so then refugee foster care, they're reclassified um, as refugees and refugee foster care is the best way to go for them as well. Um, so there are options there um, uh, to, to help with refugee foster care. We do have quite a few foster care parents um, in the Holland area. Um, so um, that is an option um, for you. Next slide. Um, these are um, what our arrivals were last year um, for Bethany. Um, we had a capacity of 240 um, and we resettled 143 of those. Um, and um, uh, this year our capacity again is at 240 um, and um, we, um, I don't know how many will end up resettling this year. Um, we didn't have hardly any arrivals through most of the fiscal year. Um, we started getting a little bit more arrivals. I think we had from October until May, I think we had 12 people that came. So it was very slow. Um, part of that was because of the presidential determination. Part of that was because of COVID. Um, in June, we had a few more, I think nine in June. We're having 30 in July, so a little bit bigger month. Um, and 16 so far scheduled for, um, for uh, August. Um, and we're expecting that to rise um, for August and September. Um, but I, you know, if we get to 100, we'll probably, that would be a lot for us for this year, but we'll see um, what the numbers look like. Um, I mentioned before the people groups that are coming, um, the vast majority of our clients that are coming, these are family reunifications. So we are reunifying um, family members that have been separated. And even though they have family here, they still need that church or community group co-sponsor to help um, get them acclimated to life here in America. Um, just want to share a quick story with you, um, just so that you can see um, the difference that this program makes. Six years ago, we welcomed um, a family, a Syrian family. They were connected with Blyfield Hills Baptist Church, and they. Um, that church welcomed them and really just poured into this family. That family at the time that they came had a adult daughter, son-in-law and baby grandson that they were expecting to come with them. But because the baby was just born, the baby had to be added to the case. Everything took time. Then there was a, um, additional security measures for Syrians coming then the change in presidential administration and um, the family just was not coming. They kept coming to our office and pleading with us, when are they gonna come? When are they gonna come? And I just didn't have an answer for them. I was in Turkey for a conference and I was able to visit the family in Turkey and get to meet them. And again, the question was, when can we come to our family? When can we come? And we just didn't have an answer. Well, um, I am happy to say that they are arriving at the beginning of August. Um, it's been six years. The little baby is now six years old. He will get to meet grandpa and grandma that he sees on um, WhatsApp all the time. Um, we'll get to see them in person for the first time. Life Field, which is now called Magnify, is going to be involved with this family, welcoming them. The family that's here in the United States, they're already US citizens. They own a home. They own cars, the kids are in college, um, they um, have become incredibly successful, and now they'll finally get to be reunited with their family. And so um, that's what it's all about for us, is that family reunification and getting to see the church so involved with the success of this family. They are still very much friends with this family. The family goes to church there, um, and so they... Um, they're very connected, and so um, we're excited to have this arrival. Next slide. So why do we do this? Um, 
uh, for us, it is about reunifying families. It's about keeping the family together. Um, we feel like at Bethany that we are serving the most vulnerable. Um, and it does, it expands our world. Um, we have, um, it expands um, our opportunity to connect with people um, from all over the world. Um, and um, it's such a blessing to be able to serve um, refugees. Next slide. It is truly um, a mandate that we see all throughout the Bible, um, the call to welcome the stranger, to care for the orphan and the widow. Um, as you know, Jesus himself was a refugee. Um, the, the family fled. And um, so it is all throughout the Bible um, that um, this is um, our, our mandate, but also our privilege and our joy to be able to welcome refugees. Next slide. <clears throat> and refugee resettlement brings the whole world to us. Um, I know that, um, you know, there are many, many churches that have a, a heart for missions and a desire to go different places and, and welcome people. Um, and, and it can be difficult in some of these countries, like to go to Burma or um, to, um, uh, to go to Syria, but we can um, welcome them here. You get to um, stay in your own bed at night. Um, uh, you can uh, continue your job and everything else um, but you get to welcome um, the world here and get to know another culture um, and um, uh, beautiful people um, that will impact and change your life. And I know that that has been the case for Larry and for um, his church. And so Larry, we just wanted you to share a little bit about your experience um, in welcoming uh, refugees. Well, thank you, uh, Christine, but it would probably take me two or three days to talk about this total experience. Um, I noticed that Don Cowie and Peggy Purdy were on this uh, Zoom meeting and uh, they, were, they were just two people out of 40 people at First Presbyterian Church that really combined to help this family arrive in the country. Uh, an example, Marilyn, my wife uh, was worried and she had a schedule about when do we visit? So we scheduled people to visit pretty much every day at the time that was acceptable to them, not during prayer time and things like that. Uh, we had driver schedules. We just had tons of paperwork or tons of things to do, but it was so rewarding because this family from the moment they arrived were so appreciative. And I know Don and Peggy and Marilyn can talk about that. Uh, they just constantly were saying, thank you, thank you. It's a blessing to be in America. Uh, we were somewhat fortunate in that Muhammad, um, uh, the family really was composed of uh, a mom by the name of Javale, Muhammad, her 27 year old son at the time and two daughters that were in their early twenties. And Muhammad could speak English to an extent that we could communicate with no trouble, which was a blessing to our effort, which it makes me think back in other refugee situations, it's very difficult when they can't speak English. But Muhammad, even as it was mentioned in the video, when he just got in a car with us, he was just all of a sudden, I'm so happy to be through the process. Um, a couple of friends and I took Muhammad's older brother here who arrived in December, 2015 to the green market in Grand Rapids to buy their culturally acceptable food. Um, and on the way over, a friend in the back seat said, Daoud, what have you noticed about this country that you can, that really sticks out? And he said, it's so peaceful. Well, Muhammad pretty much said the same thing, but it really warms my heart. And I know Don and Peggy and Marilyn would agree with me. We would go to doctor appointments or we would take them to the store and everybody treated them so kindly, so politely. And when I would say to Muhammad, boy, they, this is, this, this, is, this is what America should be about. He said, it's not like Pakistan. <laughs> so he was pointing out to me the differences between where he was. And by the way, they were Afghani family because mom was born in Afghanistan, but all the children were born in a refugee camp in Pakistan. 
And the father had got murdered by the Taliban because he was active in promoting women's education in Afghanistan. He would go on American helicopters to deliver educational materials to women in villages throughout Afghanistan. So Muhammad is definitely not happy with the current situation of leaving Afghanistan. Uh, but I just can go on and on talking about the kinds of things we did. And I think that the members that helped them get through the process probably learned as much as the family did. So I don't know what else to say unless I just go on, on, on and on. But thank you, Kristen, for letting me say something. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. We are so grateful for each one of the churches um, and individuals that has worked with us. Um, we um, do have opportunities for individuals to volunteer. So we talked a lot about groups, um, but we do have opportunities for um, individuals to volunteer as well. Um, so um, those are always options. I think we'd like to open it up now to questions. So Susan, do you have some questions that have come through the chat? I do. I have five questions currently. And if you've already answered them sometime in, during your presentation, you can just let me know that. The first one is from Larry. In 2016, how many refugees came to Michigan and more specifically to Holland? And how many churches participated in Holland? Oh my goodness, 2016. I don't know. We had um, a lot of refugees that came then. I would need to um, double check our numbers. Um, I think we were close to, we were in the high like 366 or up to 400, somewhere in there. Um, and I, I don't remember how many particularly came to Holland. I want to say it was like 20 to 25. Um, came to Holland during that time. Deb, do you remember from 2016? But we have partnered, I think it was, um, we pulled a list together of all the churches in Holland and I think it's been about 20 churches or so um, that we have partnered um, in, with, in Holland. And I know some of them have taken more than one family. Um, so, um, we have um, done all of it out of our office in Grand Rapids, but um, definitely have um, welcomed um, people here in Holland. And it has been um, a, a great fit to be able to place uh, refugees there. So I don't know that I can give you the exact numbers. I can go and look them up for you. Um, but off the top of my head, that's about as good as I get for 2016. So. That's great, thank you. Um, is there financial assistance, Norma is asking, for families in the first 90 days that ends at the 90-day mark? Yeah, so um, refugees are given a certain amount per person. Um, the number went up slightly this year. I think it's, um, I think it's $1,050 um, per person. Um, and um, that money is to be used for all of those needs within the first 90 days. So um, housing, um, which could include a security deposit, first month's rent, um, and the first couple months rent, um, uh, setting up utilities, um, food before they have food stamps, um, uh, anything that you can imagine that they would need. That's why we try to do donations as much as possible for um, uh, household items, for clothing. Um, we try to use um, resources like in the image or different places like that um, uh, to um, meet those needs so that we can use that money um, primarily um, to cover housing. So, um, and that those funds, um, that's a, a one-time amount per person. Um, and so when they're gone, they're gone. Um, and, but there is another program um, Deb mentioned called Matching Grants that does have some financial assistance that can help with rent and utility assistance and a little bit of pocket money um, that is available. And um, it's, a, it's a six month program. The financial assistance is there until they're working um, and then able to pay for things on their own. Great, thank I might, you. I might add, if I can, um, uh, 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 Kristen, that, that uh, we, we, 
it took us probably close to seven or eight months to totally stop being able have having to help them. Um, it, it, it just, it's a long process. And as much as you do, Bethany, uh, churches really step in and support. Um, I don't know exactly how much we spend at First Presbyterian Church, um, but I just know we had to do that. Um, I know Don and I would sit down with Muhammad and have budget meetings and Muhammad would text me the next day, said he couldn't sleep that night because he was so worried about money. And it, it just is a process that took some time. Uh, so, so I don't know, I think our goal was six months and I think we missed it by a month to, to get them totally independent from us. So. Right, thank you for that. Um, Gary Morris has a comment and a question. The comment is we co-sponsored a family five years ago. It has been a wonderfully fulfilling experience. The family's done a terrific job assimilating. They're the hardest pe working people I've ever known. The six month milestone is important, but the real process of guiding assimila assimilation takes years. It's now indeed a friendship, not a sponsorship, but the guidance and advice continues in year five. And uh, you can you can comment that on that, but let me go ahead and ask his question. What are the nationalities likely to be settled in Holland now? Okay. Yeah, we do um, recognize that that co-sponsorship time is that six month time, but the assimilation process goes much longer and thankfully it can move into a friendship um, so that um, they can continue to learn. Um, I lived in the Middle East for five years. I was learning that entire time um, I had people that befriended me, that showed me the culture and the language, and I was continually learning. Um, and I'm sure if I went back now, I'd have even more things um, to learn. So it definitely um, takes a long time um, uh, for them to get fully integrated into the um, community. And, and we recognize that it kind of ebbs and flows, that there's different levels of integration. Um, and so um, th those will happen uh, more as the time goes on. Um, in terms of nationalities for Holland, um, Congolese um, is probably one of the main nationalities. Um, uh, what we try to do is we try to place multiple um, families from one um, people group in a, in a place like Holland or Grand Haven um, so that we, um, can provide some community for them. Um, so Congolese are that group. We do have Afghans um, out there in Holland. And so we potentially could add more um, people from Afghanistan. Um, there are also Cubans coming right now. Um, and some of them are resettling in Holland. They do not come through the refugee resettlement process. So they do not have the same services available to them. Um, but some of them are joining family and friends in the Holland area. And so there could be volunteer options with Cubans. Um, we'll see what other people groups, I know that there are some Burmese in Holland, so we potentially could add some more Burmese. Um, but um, that's kind of our idea at this point. Um, we can always um, look at another people group. Um, the difficult thing is, is if they do have family, like in Grand Rapids, it can be harder to place them in um, Holland because they wanna be near their family because they've been separated for so long. So we really do need to be um, conscientious about that and determine um, maybe if, if their US tie is just a friend and isn't that close of a connection, um, we could place them in a place like Holland or if they come without a US tie, if they're what's called a free case, then we could place them um, uh, in Holland. So we just have to kind of make that decision on a case by case basis. Thank you. Um, you have three more questions. Um, Al, do you want to go ahead and, and ask your question first? And then um, I'll go ahead and ask these three after that. I um, wanted to know, uh, Deb, you mentioned uh, housing as uh, a, uh, a current problem. Is it more difficult now than it was, say, four or five years ago uh, in terms of housing? Has that gotten... Uh, you know, I, I sense that uh, our awareness, at least, 
of housing difficulties is uh, seems to be more acute, but in terms of resettlement, is that where is that now? Yes, definitely. We're still searching for a home um, for the family that's arriving next week. So I'm glad you mentioned that because we can put out um, a request if you are aware of a rental property for this family, we could use it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, we have a housing coordinator and I, his name is Alec. And I always say Alec's got the most difficult job of all of us right now. I used to say our, our um, employment team did several years ago, um, but now uh, we have employers calling us asking to send more of our clients because they've made such a positive name for themselves. So definitely Alec has the hardest job but getting the word out, you know, if you know of people that might have rental properties or property management that you're aware of that might be open to working with refugees, you know, as you know, they've got all these kind of unique circumstances. They don't come with credit history and that kind of thing um, and don't, don't have a job right away. That, so we need, we need uh, landlords that have a heart for this as well. And many of, of you might know them. So good to see you, Al. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. One other comment, uh, uh, Muhammad uh, certainly was uh, a key contact for our family uh, when uh, they came here. Uh, there was a couple of circumstances where he served as a resource for our family. So that was good. So kind of, yeah. uh, you know, knowing that uh, even if they're not family, uh, often uh, they uh, serve as uh, a resource for us. That's a great point. Yeah, Mohammed has been extra good at, at paying it forward, I guess, and is excited when we're sending more people that he yeah. can help. So yeah, he's a definite resource for our, our churches in Holland. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's such a great comment. So housing is um, a, a major issue right now. Um, I know in the Grand Rapids area, it's hard for anyone to find a place to rent. Um, they're just going so quickly. So to find it for refugees, as Deb said, when they don't have a credit history, job history, re US rental history, it makes it very, very difficult right now to find housing. We do have a partnership with Airbnb to be able to place people in temporary housing. Um, and there are some funds um, that Airbnb has uh, donated to, for us to be able to um, place people in temporary housing until we can find something more permanent. It's one of the reasons why we do want to place people in um, places like Holland and Grand Haven, primarily because of all the churches and community groups there that want to welcome refugees, but also because of housing is cheaper and more available, although still difficult to find um, right now. Great. Um, regarding cultural differences, asks Anne, how do Bethany and churches deal with the religious needs of Muslims? Deb, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? And Deb, you're okay. Yeah, there. Um, yeah, uh, I've, I've been so... Um, pleased with how churches work with another faith, such as Muslims. Um, many of them uh, understand the unique nature of refugee resettlement, and they help because they're Christians, um, but they don't preach or proselytize, you know, to the family. Um, sometimes, the, you know, the family will say, why are you helping me? And then churches have the opportunity to share, you know, their faith and why they're helping. But it's been really cool for me to, um, work with churches who say, you know, we just don't know a lot about Muslim, the faith and people of that faith. And uh, we think we should, we think we should know more about them and um, what they like and what they need. And so it's been really a cool thing in West Michigan for me to watch churches welcome um, non-Christian families and just uh, be accepting of them and, and becoming family with them. Um, we think it, it turns out to be a very good experience. It doesn't mean it's not intimidating for most. Um, anytime there are differences and you already have language, you know, and culture, and then you add the, the faith differences, it certainly stretches, 
people, but um, I have yet to meet one that wasn't grateful to be stretched in that way. I'm pretty sure Christine has a, something to add to that. Yeah, and we can give resources as well. Um, there are some um, moss in the Grand Rapids area. There are also um, uh, um, stores that sell halal meats and, and different things like that. So there are some options. Um, and every family is different how much they practice um, Islam. Some are um, just really nominally um, uh, practicing as Muslims and then some are quite devout. Just like you see in the Christian faith, you kind of see the, the whole gamut of it. And that's what we see in Islam as well. Um, I did want to just mention that the vast majority of refugees that we have coming are Christians, um, especially with the Congolese. The Congolese are all Christians. Um, and so um, those are the vast majority. But we do have some, like from Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq, um, that are Muslim. Thank you. Um, John Buttry is asking, can you comment on DACA and re recent court decisions? Oh, that is not my area of expertise. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I don't feel comfortable commenting on it. Deb, do you feel comfortable commenting on DACA? No, but I feel very comfortable finding someone else for another session of HASP, if that's what you would like. <laughs> that is uh, another, another program of Bethany that would be very knowledgeable that we can connect you with. Yeah. Sorry, I hate question. to enter in on something that is not my expertise, so. I think that's fair and prudent. Um, and the last question that I'm in the chat before we open it up, we have about six minutes left. Norm is asking in the presentation, the decline in refugee arrivals from 1980 to recent was displayed. During this time, was there a concomitant increase in migrant arrivals? Um, I don't know. I know that there has been um, an a decrease of um, possible immigration options for the United States. Um, we definitely need immigration reform. Um, there are not a lot of really great ways for somebody to legally immigrate to the United States. Um, so, um, but I am not sure about how the the migrant numbers would would be um, if they would correlate or not. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I see Deb shaking her head too. So maybe that is a question that we'll look further into by Google or maybe another <laughs> expert that comes to the table at HASP. So that is it for the chat. Um, would anybody like to unmute themselves and um, ask a question or make a comment? Okay, well, Christine or Deb, if you have anything that you think that you might wanna ask back to the group to, to get some discussion going in the next four or five minutes or Larry, um, or we can simply thank you and close the class. Well, uh, before we do that, I just wanna extend a, on behalf of HASP, a very warm, Thank you for doing this presentation. Uh, the five years that a number of us on this, on this, in this class have had with experience with Bethany Christian uh, and especially Deb, since she's the local contact, has just been wonderful. So just from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of many hearts here, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you from Has. And um, we are, we're so grateful for our partnership with you. Um, I think this is the second time I presented with Hass, so um, it's it's been great to to be able to do this. And um, we're really grateful for all of the churches um, in the um, Holland area that have welcomed refugees so well and have kind of gone above and beyond because of the distance from our office. You guys have stepped in and done extra things and. We're so grateful um, that we've been able to place refugees in Holland. It's been a very welcoming community. Mm -hmm. 
We're certainly glad. And I, I want to compliment you on the production of that. The video is excellent and just super well done. And I think that it encapsulates the vision and the execution and really the human beings behind what you're doing. And it does that very, very well. So um, with that, if uh, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to say, we thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Bye, yes. everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. All right.